Uh, hey everyone, thanks, uh, thanks for joining today. I uh, hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. Uh, so so uh, today the topic of my presentation is how to be better uh, as a data-driven product manager. So if you are a, someone looking into getting into product management or someone just getting started, I wanted to share some tips and experience that helped me a lot and I hope will help you. And if you're an experienced product manager who wants to hear some stories and learn something new, then you're more than welcome to, uh, to join and listen. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a senior product manager. I worked at Coupon. Uh, I worked at Knowledge U, started up in uh, Lebanon. Uh, I have product management experience in mobile apps and mobile marketing. And I have an undergrad in computer science, and recently I got my MBA. All right. Um, and the agenda for today, basically, I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, first, how you can own your data, what to do to own your metrics and data, which will make your life easier. Um, regarding experimentation analysis, something else that will help is planning. And finally, how you can trust your instinct and, and be ready to, to push back and know when things are looking right and are not looking great. So um, I want to start with a story. Uh, one of my former managers once was telling his story about uh, he met the CEO of the company. He ran across in the hallway and the CEO asked him, so how's uh, your product doing? Um, and that's an interesting question. When you, when you get a question like this from the CEO, what are they really, really looking for? And so basically what my manager told me, he said, oh, it's going great. It's doing great. And then he got this follow, follow up uh, question. How, how do you know? And you know, when you get this question on the spot from your manager or from the CEO, it means like, hey, something might be missing in the answer. And perhaps what are they really looking to know? They want to know, do you really, are you really owning your product? Uh, do you know the, the metrics and data going on? Uh, and, and here's another way that, that this question could be answered. Perhaps you can say, so how's your product doing? And say, oh, last week we added this new feature. It's driving X additional users, increasing Y percent from last month. If you compare this answer, you can see uh, it, it has uh, specific numbers, it's uh, time-driven, and it shows ownership. And basically what I want to try to, to uh, present today is how we can be ready to answer questions like this, to be ready for situations like this, and, and to be better owners of our product and our metrics. So I'll start with my first advice, to simplify and automate. Um, and I can tell you how much this helped me personally as a product manager. It, sound, it sounds really uh, obvious and a given, but I think uh, it's something that, that's, that's super helpful. Uh, why should we do that? First of all, you will know all the ins and outs. Uh, you will be always familiar with them. Uh, you know all the numbers and you'll be the SME of, of your numbers. Second, when you get familiar with your numbers, when you know what's happening, it's easier to identify opportunities. Uh, this is something from my own personal experience. And at the same time, you can easily spot when something is going wrong and quickly address it. Uh, and finally, another thing that's important also is, you know, when your metrics are automated, uh, when it's easier to access, a lot of time will be will be uh, will be freed up to focus on on important tasks, um, and you don't want to be spending every day one or two hours finding your metrics and and uh, really wasting time that could be spent on customer research or on launching features or, or meeting with with engineers. And finally, be comfortable asking questions like the one I just. Uh, showed you the story I just told you about uh, and how how there here are some ways to do it and I'm sure that there could be others but th these are some things that help me personally first of all identifying what are the main sources and dashboards um, and if they're not available create them or become friend with with the BI team and see if they can help creating them uh, and look if your company uses Tableau uh, there are also other tools like Chartio, Looker, even Google Data Studio, I found that was a very simple tool. Uh, if, if you want to build something quick and easy that helps you get what you want. Um, and also, uh, having a logging and monitoring tool 
or even looking at these two from, from engineers could be helpful. That's number one. Every morning, you know, when you have all your dashboards or your metrics ready, spend 10 to 15 minutes every morning reviewing, uh, getting yourself familiar with it, uh, making sure everything is good. Maybe up to half an hour, but no longer. You don't want to spend too much time on this. You just want to make sure you're familiar with what's going on and focus on what is the most important for your product. Because when you, when you are looking at your day-to-day, -day, really what you care about is what is the most important. And if something does not look right or you want to look into something more, then it makes sense to dive deeper and, and to understand what's going on. Uh, but if you, if you add too many metrics or if you add too much information upstart, it might consume a little bit too much of your time uh, and, and might not be uh, too productive initially. Uh, and, and one tip I, I, can, I can share is when you're starting a new PM role, uh, joining a new company, or even if you're owning a new product, you will have an initial uh, uh, number of days to learn, maybe the first 15 days, maybe the first 30 days. And one way that uh, you can help speed up that process is spend some of these days on setting up these dashboards and these metrics. Uh, first, it will help you do this upfront. And second, you will learn about this product much faster. That, that's a tip. Now, moving on to the next, uh, the next advice is how to be better at experimentation. And just to be clear, I'm not going to explain how A-B test works or what are the details. I just want to share some, uh, a tip that helped me become better at it. Um, and basically, this tip is planning, planning ahead. Uh, and by planning, I don't mean sophisticated uh, st statistical statistical planning. Uh, it, can, it can be something super simple. Uh, first, it can be a one-page plan where you can explain how you're going to do this experimentation or analysis. And second, explain what success will look like. And finally, explain what to do in case of success and failure. Uh, th this was one of the uh, things I, I learned from Groupon and I found super useful. Um, and, and why do you want to do a plan? Number one, having a plan helps, helps your uh, uh, future, future launch to be in check. You have a plan, you know what's going to happen if, in case of success, in case of failure. If someone else wants, is more curious about what's going on, you have this one pager ready that you can share anytime. Uh, and also in case of failure, that's one of the most important things. You will know what to do. Do you just stop everything or do you proceed? Um, and going into each uh, of these in detail. So first about explaining your approach, just sim a simple like a few lines explaining uh, what are you trying to do. For example, if you're doing an A-B test, you can just explain what are the main differences between the control and the treatment, how many users uh, you want to interact with, uh, and how long the test will run. If you are doing a gradual rollout, because you, know, you cannot always do an A-B test, you can explain, okay, what percent of users will be impacted initially, maybe you're gonna roll this out to 5% and look at the data. And then if things look well, continue rolling out by 10% uh, and explain that uh, even pre-post analysis or other types of experimentation, just have a simple paragraph with some numbers that, that uh, if someone wants, is interested to know what you're, what you're uh, doing, they can review this and understand quickly. And second, defining what success uh, looks like. Uh, and I think this is very important because you can say the, a feature, for example, will improve the buyer conversion rate. And that, that's, I mean, that's okay. You're, you're saying what it will do, but it's not really, but it, it's missing something. Uh, it's, it's vague. It's really vague and gener generic. Um, and it's better to, to be more specific and have uh, be more, be, and measure, be more measurable. For example, you can say this feature will increase conversion rate by 5% and will bring $100,000 in revenue annually. Uh, having this, uh, this uh, smart goal, at least, will, will, you, can, you can see like if, if your uh, experiment or your analysis shows an in increase by 3%, is this still close enough to the goal? Uh, and should, it, should you, you proceed with it? Or if, it, if it's higher than that, then, then what to do? Or if it fails? So it's good to define success and, and even if it's like one line or two lines, and it's also good to 
to be specific in what success looks like. And I, and I am aware that it's not always possible to be very specific because uh, if it's a new product or if it's uh, just a customer test or customer interview, but at least having some level of, of uh, specificity or, or some level of, uh, you know, of, of what we're trying to, what, what we want success to look like can, can be at all helpful. And finally, how to address success and failure. And basically here, in this example, uh, I, mean, I use a decision matrix. Uh, for example, maybe you have two metrics for success and failure. And this matrix helps, helps to, to, to see what to do in each scenario. Uh, if something is successful, metric one and metric two, then go ahead and roll this out to everyone. Uh, if metric one fails, but metric two is successful, the metric one is more important than stop and review what to do and, and uh, evaluate. And it doesn't have to be like this format. It can be a table, it can be uh, something else, but, but it's good to know in advance. For example, what if the experiment is a failure and we, we, do we want to reevaluate? Do we want to stop everything? What if the numbers don't change at all? then what do we want to do in this case? It's good to know in advance and, and think about what, 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 uh, uh, how, how do we want to approach success or failure? Do we want, even if something is successful, is it successful as much as we want and do we want to continue or expand further? Um, and a few tips also about experimentation. I mean, keep it simple. We, we are product managers. Our goal is not to be statisticians. Uh, it's, uh, unless your company, you know, has specific policies, uh, unless you work in an industry where uh, having, having very, very specific uh, or, or more sophisticated plans is, uh, is necessary. Uh, I would say to keep it simple uh, and just focus on the most important things. Um, be aware of, of analysis paralysis. Remember, this is just a, a blueprint or, or guideline to see what, what to do in, in cases. You don't want to go too deep. You don't want to spend too much time on this and, and try to, um, and try to, to uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, mean, I think uh, like, you, you know what I, what I mean? Like try to get to the smallest of the details. Just think about the 80, 20 rule. And also be careful of oversimplifying of being too vague and too generic because this can also be a trap. And finally, it's something more that, do in your free time, but uh, when, when writing the experiment, make sure you are using proper convention, make, make sure you are using the right wording, uh, may, uh, understand what each, what each number, what each uh, number means and, and how to express it. Not saying, again, not saying uh, to be very detailed, to, to speak like a statistician, but, but knowing what to say, because someone who understands experimentation, someone who, if, you, if uh, someone understands how things work, and, and you say something in the wrong way, then it could be uh, appear as a yellow flag. And um, finally, for, for my uh, last advice to trusting your instincts with data. Um, you know, data helps to make decisions on products, to ha helps to make decisions on features, but sometimes it's, n it's not always the case. Um, sometimes the data will not make sense. Your metric, uh, is a little off of the charts or too high or too low or looks, looks weird. Sometimes it's possible you, you make a mistake um, and then data doesn't would not look, look right. Uh, confirmation bias is something that uh, I, I saw a lot, uh, something that I ex experienced a lot. I even made some, some, some of my own mistake. Uh, and finally, sometimes you don't have the luxury of the data. Um, Maybe you're launching something completely new and, and where there's very few uh, customers or like an MVP and, and the data might not be available for you. So it's good to, to you know, uh, address this in, in very different ways. And here what I'm sharing my own experience, what I do in these situations, and of course others might have other experiences or, or in your own experience as a PM, you might come up with new things. Um, so let's say, for example, you see a huge variation in your data when something is really big and you feel something is wrong. I would say like, look at secondary metrics. Does everything look right? Uh, check for outliers. Sometimes one outlier 
can skew your whole, your whole um, numbers. Uh, let's say in e-commerce, someone buys a product that costs a hundred thousand dollar, completely changes all your numbers. So look at that. Make sure make sure of, of there if there are outliers. Check for mistakes, um, and also look for macro trends. Sometimes there are macro trends outside of the of the micro environment. Something happening uh, with in our neighborhood and in our country and the world that could also impact that. Uh, another another thing that I experience is sometimes I get uh, I work with I have stakeholders and they give me estimates and sometimes these, these estimates don't look very realistic and looking eventually uh, as a PM you become you, your eye will become trained to detect this and sometimes you're right sometimes you're not but it's good to do some some due diligence here when someone gives you an estimate it says this will improve our business by 50 percent it's good to uh, question that uh, you can hey can i at least see the model can i take a look at the model can we do a quick test uh, a quick mvp to verify this assumption you don't want to spend months building something only to realize that it does not really drive numbers this this, this well uh, and also where the customer had think Hey, if I'm a customer, if I see this change or if, if I see this feature, will it really make me do, do what it's supposed to do? Uh, wear the customer hat and, and try to question these assumptions and, and question uh, what you see. And sometimes it's possible, like you feel too good about your data. It's good, it's good to feel good about data. Feeling too good about the data, once in a while, it's good to take a step back and, and review things. And just to be clear, not, not, not saying to be critical all the time. It's good to be critical sometimes. It's good to, to, to step back and look at it. But uh, you, know, you don't want to do that all the time. You don't want to impact your own productivity. You don't want to impact your own confidence. But in some cases, things look too good. You feel too good. Think about, hey, maybe I want to do a, a due diligence. want to go a step back. Look, make sure everything is good before I go and, and uh, publish this to everyone and let everyone know about it or, or send this to customers. Um, and, you know, I, as I was saying, with your product management experience, the more you get exposed to your metrics, the more you get exposed to how customers behave, you become trained at this. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. It's okay to make mistakes initially. I made a lot of mistakes when I started. Uh, as long as you address them, every, uh, it will be. It will be, and, and you are honest about about them, and you know how to fix them. Then things will work out. Should work out well. Uh, and I, th I believe this to be a process. First, you get familiar with your metrics and customer trends. Then you launch more features, and you get even more familiar with how these features are doing. The more the more features and products you launch get exposed to metrics, get exposed to how customers behave, the more data you get trained to understand your own data, and your own metrics. Uh, and, and this feeds back again to getting even more familiar. Um, it will make your, your instincts and your gut stronger and, and you will make much better, more informed decisions. Again, the data is here to help us make decisions. It's not there to, to uh, replace common sense, judgment, and, and customer, customer thinking. And finally, uh, so these are my key takeaways. Um, again, automate and simplify to own your metrics, plan ahead before experimenting, and trust your instincts. Um, uh, you will make mistakes, and this will help you become a better product manager and a, and a more data-driven product manager. Uh, I hope this was helpful. If you have any, any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and uh, please, everyone, uh, be safe.